So I was asked by some of the team just to do a short session, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something like that, just to talk to some of you about science communication. And this isn't really about how to do good science communication. This is more about why science communication is important. So I'm going to discuss what I think and what you think. This is going to be quite interactive. Sorry. Uh, what you think the benefit of science communication is for science, for researchers like yourselves, and for the public. Those are the, so the sorts of things I'd like to think about today. Uh, I'm going to start by saying who I am. Uh, then we're going to have a look at what this science communication is, who does it, um, and why we think it's important to do it. So, and then maybe a little bit about the future of science communication as well. So who am I? I'm Greg. Uh, so I am now a freelance science communicator. It is my job. I am a professional science communicator. Uh, I'm a scientist by training. I studied natural sciences at Cambridge, um, doing a whole load of different sciences. Then I went to Imperial College in London and did a master's course, a postgraduate course in science communication um, as part of their science communication group there. Then I went and started working for the BBC um, and uh, I worked for them for whew, a few years. I'd started presenting shows for children actually first and then that moved to presenting uh, programs for adults. I do a lot of stuff on stage, especially for children. That's big scale, that's kind of a lot of explosions and fun science experiments, but it's also more considered talks um, about Oh, everything. I, I went to Everest two years ago with a bunch of scientists and wrote a really interesting talk about their cutting edge research. So I talk on, on everything. Um, and I do a lot on YouTube as well. So um, I've mentioned already the, the AXA research files that I've done with seven of the AXA research scientists uh, from last year. So I'll just show you a little clip from that in a minute. So uh, we'll talk more about YouTube later because I, I find YouTube very interesting. For somebody who's done a lot of television for 10 years, um, I've been doing YouTube for three years and I think it's very exciting and it's going to be the future. But we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so first, let me show you a clip. Uh, it's kind of a, a trailer for what myself and Charlie, who's at the back, did with um, Isabel and, and, and the rest of the team uh, at the Axe Research Fund with seven of the researchers last year and we're hoping to do some more. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so that was, uh, we made seven films for YouTube, one film on, on each of the seven scientists that we worked with, um, kind of explaining their science, putting it in a real world context um, and having some adventures along the way. It was, it was a lot, a lot of fun. So what is science communication? Before you came today, who has heard the phrase of science communication? About 50-50. Okay, interesting. Um, I think a few years ago, it was a phrase that not many people knew, and it's now become uh, a kind of common phrase. Uh, it used to be science engagement. There's a very interesting history behind science communication that we can talk about over a coffee sometime. Um, but there is now this thing called science communication. So what I'd like to do is throw to you um, and get a sense of what you think science communication is. Now I'll start. We can, we can say it's an umbrella term for the communication of science, technology, engineering, maths. That could be communication, engagement, discussion, conversation, anything really. It's very broad, really broad. And I think the best way to think about what is science communication is more where is science communication? Where is it done? So this is what I want to get your thoughts on. Where, where have you seen science communication being done? Go. Any ideas? Radio, television. Magazines, radio, tick, tick. TV. TV, of course, yep. School, School yeah, yeah. Do we think that a, a teacher standing and teaching in a school is science communication? Hmm. Good, I had a yes and a no, which I think is probably the right answer. <laughs> it, again, it depends on our definition. And if, if we're throwing the, the umbrella, the net very wide, then it could be a bit of everything. OK, so we had a few of the traditional broadcast models, as we call it. So TV, radio. Um, where else do we go? So an open day. 
Um, so that could be workshops, um, talks, anything like that. Great suggestion. Museum. Museums. Museums are very much a, a very different form of science, science communication. Of course, in a museum you can have talks and you can have lectures and you can have workshops, but the act of going around a museum and being hands-on with exhibits is also science communication. Any other ideas? Twitter. <laughs> Social media, Twitter. What did you say? I would actually, yeah. <laughs> Back on brand. Well done. Uh, so yeah, social media, I think, is a whole other area as well. And uh, Twitter, Facebook, they're all different platforms for science communication. It doesn't have to be something else that's happening a, as an open day or a workshop that you also put on Twitter. There are Twitter accounts that are just there for science communication and they only do it on Twitter or just on Facebook. Who, who likes IFLS? I like science. Right, that started as a Facebook page and has now trickled out onto other media as well, but that shows you that it can just start on social media. Yeah, so a MOOC, for those of you who don't know it, is a Massive. massively Massive. online open. open course. Yeah, a MOOC. Um, so that could be, I mean, that is a form of science communication for the people who are presenting it, potentially. Some of them are a lot more uh, traditional and some of them are more uh, new broadcast methods in what they do. So that's lovely, haven't had that one before. That's, I'm gonna add that to my list. Uh, I also thought you said a book, which we haven't, we haven't had, but of course you can have both factual and fictional books that are science communication as well. Okay, um, journals we haven't talked about. I know they're quite often scientist to scientist, but that is still science communication. It's just a very particular uh, audience that you're aiming to communicate with. Uh, we've had magazines and newspapers. Here's my, here's my list that I pulled together on the train. Uh, so we had broadcast. Now you can, some people separate broadcast into traditional broadcast and new broadcast, so modern. I mean, it doesn't really work like that, but TV, radio, traditional, podcasts. Nobody mentioned podcasts. Who listens to, to a lot of podcasts on the... Yeah, I've really got into podcasts recently. My favourite, Radio Lab. Do you listen to that? 99% mm. Invisible. Brilliant. Mm. Check them out if you haven't watched any. Feature films. No one mentioned feature films. Sunshine. Who watched Sunshine? Okay, so I think Brian Cox and a bunch of other science communicators were very much involved in helping with the, the, uh, the background, fact-checking, helping them describe things they're doing. Who watched, um, what was the most recent one? Uh, where they ended up in a black hole. Oh. Interstellar, yeah. Interstellar, yeah. yeah. So there was a whole team involved in that. Why they decided it would look like a library, I don't know. But Interstellar, there's a whole team of science communicators involved in that. So I think feature films we have to use. YouTube is kind of my, my baby, so it's, it's good to talk about that. And games, no one talked about games. I think games, are, games can definitely have a factual science communication input to them. I won't go through the list, you can have a look up there. Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk briefly about citizen science later. Okay, so I think a good way to think more about science communication, we've thought of what it is, like, and I, where it is, where you can go find it, but what about who it is? Who is doing science communication? Me, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it is only me. <laughs> I do all of the stuff. Um, who else does science communication? Scientists. Scientists, Scientists. yep. Scientists. Say again? Journalists. Journalists, of course. Filmmakers, Filmmakers teachers. teachers. Curators. Curators for the museum's aspect, yeah. Turn into the kids. Possibly the kids, yeah. I've seen some fantastic, done some great work with kids where we've encouraged them to make their own science communication films. You know, make a film on why is the sky blue or make a film about asthma. And the work that the children do is much better than, <laughs> than lots of the science communicators I know. Um, so some can be done by the scientific institutions themselves, and that could be the press office within that science communication institution. That could be the scientists themselves. If it's the scientists themselves, it's normally part-time because you've got your actual active research to be doing, and that comes with uh, difficulties that we can talk about later. Um, some scientists then are science communicators on some of the media platforms, so TV and radio and podcasts. 
But of course, a lot of science communication is done by people who are not active scientists. I am not an active scientist anymore. I studied science, I did a postgraduate in science, but I'm no longer an active scientist. But I do have a science background. So I find that's really helpful because I find that I know uh, a lot, a little. So I've got a shallow knowledge in a really broad area, um, whereas you all have part of that, a very deep knowledge within your specific field. So if somebody comes to me and asks me to talk about the heart, and stents, as we did with Professor Barakat last year, I will research, I'll spend a lot of time researching that particular area of physiology or, or whatever. But because I've got that broad background, it, it really helps me in the foundations. Um, and some people, some journalists are science backgrounds, but many journalists aren't, which is something I want to talk about. Because I think that uh, obviously it has massive benefits. They can talk the language, they understand a lot of the science. Again, it might be broad and shallow like myself. But then you know, we've got to admit that there is a definite benefit with somebody with an outside viewpoint coming in. Somebody who is bright, intelligent, someone who can look at all the facts and analyze it from a different view, who are maybe speaking to a public who hold a different view of science. And we've got to appreciate that there's a real benefit there it's a, it's a difficult one, and I think you get different outputs. But uh, let me just plant that seed in your brain to think about during a discussion in a minute. Okay, what we haven't addressed yet, which is the big thing that I want to talk about, is why is science communication important? Um, only a, a big handful of you here knew about the phrase science communication. I'm quite interested to know how many people think that science communication is an important thing. Um, as I've already mentioned, scientists need to be doing their research. So asking a scientist to go and do science communication is time out from when you could be doing research. Science communication takes a lot of time to do a good job. Um, and that's obviously a, a challenge. So. What I'd like to talk to you to talk to each other about, and then we'll kind of feed back, is why is science communication important? Let me give you a couple of different perspectives. The first perspective is there are some people who say that scientists should not go out and talk to the public. They should not have to go out and talk to the public. That they should be able to focus on what they're doing, objective research, not impacted by the public at all. That's one view. There are others who say it's your duty to communicate, that you should go and talk to the public because what you're researching has an impact on the public. These feel like two ends of a, of a spectrum. So I'd love to get your thoughts on this. So uh, you may not know the person next to you, you may know the person next to you. So we're just gonna have a discussion. And the three areas I'd like to think about are is science communication, it's not, the answer doesn't have to, you don't have to think it is important. So is science communication important for science? And if so, why? Is it important for the public? And if so, why? And is it important for you? Is there a benefit for each of you who are researchers to do this or any other roles that you take within, uh, within AXA? So firstly, for any social scientists in the room, I apologise. I'm using public as a singular, and I know that any social scientist will say, no, nah, there isn't one public, Greg. There's so many different groups of publics, and they each come with their own. No, we're not going there, okay? We're leaving that one, so we're just talking about the public as a whole. Okay, so um, please do discuss this amongst yourselves. I kind of want a good five, ten minute discussion about this. This is the meat of kind of what uh, why we're here. I wanted to start some conversations and start you thinking about it. So please turn to each other and think through those three bits. I'm going to come round and find out what you're thinking. Um, I had some interesting insights into what some people were thinking. Uh, I'm going to tell you my thoughts on the, th on the three things because I've spent a lot of time thinking of them and kind of bringing them together. Um, the question I was asking to most people was, did any, does anybody think, and just be honest, that the answer to any of those questions is no? So is science communication important for science? Did anybody think it is not? Does anybody 
come to this closer to this side of the spectrum that that you shouldn't be you don't need to be communicating okay for the public do we all think we should be communicating with the public okay uh, and for you do you think it's a benefit okay good that's a good start because quite often people will be like no and then that's an interesting conversation so let me tell you why I think science communication is important for these three things. And I kind of jotted my thoughts down because I wanted to kind of condense it. So I, why I think science communication is important for science, and this echoes something that this group here was saying, is that there's a danger of scientists and experts being seen as um, unapproachable experts in the ivory tower. And I think that science communication breaks that down and people can see that scientists are real people doing very interesting work. So I think that's the first point. Um, I think the public, another conversation I heard about, the, the public almost need to feel like that they have a say in it or that they know what's happening because their taxes are paying for it or it's something that could impact on them. So that's another reason why I think it's important for science and the credibility of science to, to open the doors and have those conversations. Um, and also, I think, to show the beauty in science. You know, I think that's very, that's very important for science, this, this pursuit of knowledge and, and the, the method by which we do it is a, is a beautiful thing that I think it is good to, to share and to show. So that's, that's why I think it is, it is important for science. Why I think it's important for the public or the publics, for any social scientists watching this video. Um, so I think, having condensed it down, that science communication is, is a way to introduce the public to a scientific, rational-based way of thinking. So to introduce them to the methods that we use in science to come by reliable information. And just to introduce them to that method of, of thinking. So that, so that we can start a conversation between scientists and the public and science communicators and the public um, that helps the public understand the science that is relevant to them. So notice I'm not saying you should tell the public this. I'm not saying the public deserve or should be told X, Y, or Z. I'm saying that it's the role of science communication to present the information and to introduce them to the information so that if the public decide to take that information and to read more about it or, or analyse it. They have the tools. I think that's our responsibility to provide the, the information, the basic information, the tools, so that they can make rational based decisions that will impact their lives in the future. That, that's kind of what I think. So we could be talking GM or vaccination or nuclear power or risk, of course, you know. So I think it's important that, that that's our job. That's what I think it is. A quick history of that. In the old days, um, people used to think that we needed to start this thing called science communication because the public had a lack of knowledge about science and they should have knowledge about science. This was called the deficit model. This was the public understanding of science movement. So we thought, right, we'll do science communication, we'll fill them up, this empty bucket, we'll fill them up with science and the world will be a better place. And then we realised that's a little bit strong. And it's not really right to be forcing things down people's throats. So actually, we then move to what's known as PEST, PEST, the public engagement with science and technology. And we've kind of moved beyond. So now it's more about engagement and conversation and providing some of the information, but not saying you have to know this, you should know this. That's my opinion. That's, that's my perspective. Be very interested to hear whether you think that's too strong or too weak um, afterwards. And finally, for you, for the researchers, well, you know, and this was something you were saying actually, which touched on it really nicely, that in the act of doing science communication, by you translating your work for an audience, the public, you will potentially get to understand your work from a different angle. And having worked a lot with um, a lot of scientists and a lot of training, it's been really interesting saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna change that from the nature style level to a eight year old, you know? And, and through doing that process, they've had to simplify. So we've discussed whether that is dumbing down 
whether that is lying. We've discussed actually whether actually that translation is a useful process to go through. And, and quite a number of scientists have gone, I've never thought of it like that. Or, oh great, now I can explain it in this way. So I think there is a benefit, a real benefit to researchers doing science communication because you get to see things from, from different lights. Um, you get a context, I think this is what, what a few others were saying. You get a context from those conversations with people that you may not have if you are just in your lab or other people's lab within your network. And also, you might enjoy it. It might be fun, which it is. Um, and I'm just going to add for me, because I suppose I'm the you, but I'm not an active researcher anymore. I'm a science communicator. Why do I do science communication? Um, I enjoy sparking an audience's curiosity. So kind of provoking them, enlightening them some wonder in them so that they look at the world in a different way or that they'll go out and ask more questions because they were scared of asking questions or, or something like that. So that for me is, is what it's all about, curiosity, I think, and, and inspiration. If you ever write a piece of communication about risk, please don't do what a lot of people sometimes do. I don't think you will. It's, it's a thing that journalists tend to do that is a big mistake, a big fail. Um, quite often they talk about relative risk. So I pulled out an example. Having conversations with your phone to your ear doubles the risk of brain cancer. <laughs> right? Panic, panic. When the absolute risk, not the relative risk, is more like having a conversation with your phone to your ear rather than hands-free increases the likelihood of brain cancer from, say, one in a million to two in a million. It's very different, you know? So relative risk um, and absolute risk are, are two things to just be, be aware of. I may be preaching to the converted. You may already know this, but it's just something to think about, the way that things can be interpreted. Okay, so just to finish, just for the last five minutes or so, um, I'd just like to talk about the future of science communication and just to have a bit of a conversation amongst yourselves for five minutes before we wrap up and all go home or eat cake. Um, so let's get your thoughts on this first and then I'll just do a little wrap up at the end and say goodbye. So back to each other again. We talked about where science communication is happening very briefly. We looked at broadcast and we looked at social media etc just have a little conversation about where you think that may go just for a few minutes or five minutes over to you just amongst yourselves okay i'll come round and and listen this conversation was about 3d <laughs> and how the future could all be about you know uh, headsets and and that sort of thing talk here was about social media and the pros and cons of of a lot of communication moving on to social media, and I'm so, sure there were lots of interesting conversations. So this is good. We wanted to start conversations, so this is, this is brilliant. Uh, I'm going to tell you my thoughts on this subject of what I think the future of science communication could be. Um, you can see that we've moved from uh, the traditional schedule-driven uh, way of consuming media, so television, that sort of thing. I, I, I now don't watch TV. At all. I watch it all on demand, so I watch what I want to watch when I watch it. Um, I moved through the watching TV, then I moved to the let's record it onto the set-top box, and now I've moved to you don't need to do that because it's all on iPlayer or Netflix. Don't really even watch iPlayer, just watch Netflix, you know. <laughs> so, so I think, and, and obviously a lot of YouTube. So I think we're going to move even, even more. I think the 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 the, <laughs> the the chart will kind of move even even more that way. Um, I also think it's a bigger opportunity. So recently, I, I had a, I've done a number of TV series, and one of them was on, on a BBC channel three years ago. And uh, it was a interesting. It was back when I liked to get very uh, stuck in. So I was, uh, hi, welcome. Uh, I was buried alive. I was frozen. I was shot. Uh, all sorts of things. And it was on TV, and it, people were interested. Uh, it started going on YouTube two weeks ago. Within three days, one clip got a million hits. Uh, another clip within a week got a million hits. So I think there's a lot bigger audience and more... Uh, okay, okay, so it's a particular type of content. That's a very kind of, you know, headline-grabbing content. 
um, something I was doing a lot of a few years ago and now I'm doing more considered pieces <laughs> uh, of kind of more cutting edge research. But I think that there's a, a very different audience and a bigger audience um, out there. Um, and I think that YouTube offers, as we were talking, offers interactivity that TV doesn't. You sit there and you watch television. Um, whereas I think YouTube offers much more interactivity through comments or through uh, a whole realm of other things that we could, we could discuss. I think podcasts are very interesting versus radio, although radio is also very much going on to podcasts as soon as it's been on, on radio anyway. Um, and let's go back to something I mentioned earlier, which is citizen science. Now, only about four or five hands went up when I said, what is citizen science? So let me tell you what citizen science is. It is the idea of data, because we're talking about data. It's the idea of uh, not only gathering data from the public and from a whole myriad of different types of public, but it's also the idea of allowing the public to help you and analyse the data. So a very good example that everyone quite often quotes is a group called Galaxy Zoo. So you go to the Galaxy Zoo website and you see pictures of galaxies uh, and it's very popular with kids. And you go on there and you go, that's a spiral galaxy. That's a nebula. I don't know astronomy. That's uh, something else. So they are, they, are, they are inviting the public to get involved in the analysis of the data. There's one about penguins. Uh, where you can look at the, the patterns of penguins and help track them and, and this sort of thing. So, and it's, more, it's getting very, very popular and it has huge hits. So citizen science is something very interesting. It is definitely a form of science communication. They are active, they are involved. They are more active involved than they would be in a talk or, or watching YouTube or listening to a podcast. Um, so maybe we can build more into citizen science so that not only are they active and feel they're part of it, they're also learning or, or becoming inspired whilst, whilst doing it. Um, I think there are also alternatives with apps on tablets and phones um, for ways to collect data or ways to share it, a way to analyse it or ways to, at the touch of a button, ingest it and get access to it. So, I think the future for science communication is incredibly bright. I'm really excited. I've, it's been great being part of it for the last few years and I'm very excited to see where it goes. Um, that's all the time we have for today. It's just a short discussion, really. Um, I'd, so just to kind of recap, what I wanted to do was to introduce you to what science communication is or maybe it's a term that's so big and broad it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but there's lots of different areas of science communication. Maybe it will inspire some of you to think about, maybe rather than writing a blog post, you may think about recording a YouTube film, or you might think about recording a podcast. Um, so hopefully that's raised some ideas. But more importantly, I wanted to start a conversation about why and the benefits of it and the usefulness of it for science, for you and for the public. So please carry on that conversation. I think it's a very interesting, take it back to your institutions, in your labs, talk to your colleagues um, and think about that some more. And also to inspire you with the future because it's an, an exciting and interesting future. Um, and the great thing is you're all part of the AXA Research Fund and that part of that is about dissemination of what you're doing as well. So, you know, the team here are very uh, supportive of, of that. But of course, there are the tensions of doing it alongside your active work. So enjoy treading the path. Enjoy the adventure in science communication, wherever it takes you. Um, if you've got any questions, come up and ask them at the end. But eat cake and then have a safe journey home. Thank you very much, everybody.